Right next. It's time for Morning Today with Jonathan Mark on AM 1480 WLEA. <laughs> Computers are turned against me this morning. It has been a computer morning. First, A number one, four o'clock. I'm in the office. I'm going to start printing stuff off. The net. And the printer isn't working. And it isn't working. And it's not working. Then the computer freezes up. So the computer freezes up and the printer isn't working. So at 4 o'clock in the morning, after I try about three or four times to print something, I start arguing with the printer. Now I'm arguing with the printer and the computer at 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm scaring the cats. So I got all, all the cats out. They didn't want to hear anything about it. So finally, about, let me see, that was four. I would say after I turned everything off, turned it back on, restarted this, restarted that, finally I just unplugged everything. If there was a wire anywhere, I just unplugged it. And I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. I'm going to let everybody just think about it here. Everybody calm down. It'll work. So finally, about an hour and a half later, about an hour and a half later at 5.30, the printer kind of sort of starts up again. So that's how that started. I assume it might be working again when I get home. I have no idea. But, you know, once computers have turned against you, it's all over. I mean, it's really all over. Then I get in the car about maybe 45 minutes ago, and there's a little message on the little uh, the message board on the dashboard. It says, due for an oil change, or oil change due. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. I still have 2,500 miles left. There, an oil change cannot be due right now. I just changed the oil not too awfully long ago. So it says oil change due. So I'll have to see about that. But apparently the computers are turned against me this morning. It's, I don't know how this morning is going to go. But on the upside, as Paul Harvey said, it is Friday, Friday. Always the best time of the year, no matter when it occurs. And on this day, uh, it's, uh, let me see, May 3rd, the first Friday in May. And, you know, traditionally, it's the end of the work. We're not going to see a Monday through Friday work week ever again. I mean, it's going to be, you know, it's seven days a week, and that's all there is to it. But old-fashioned, it's a five-day work week, and Friday is the end of the week, and tomorrow starts the weekend, and yippee. Now, yesterday afternoon, I'm on the side porch, and here comes, are you ready, a hummingbird, the first hummingbird of the season. Of course, we don't have any flowers out yet. So there he is, kind of the, the buzzing around the uh, side porch, and there's nothing there. So he gave up and said, well, there's nothing here to eat, and off he went. So that was it, but the first hummingbird of the season. And this morning, before the computer start uh, uh, things uh, uh, began, uh, I was up at 1.30, having coffee outside, and the spring peepers were out. Now, I think, you know, I recall last year, I don't remember hearing the spring peepers at all. I don't know how that happened, but I didn't hear them at all. And this morning, there they are, the first spring peepers of the season, so I guess it's all going to be all right. Now, for this weekend, this is the third, tomorrow is the fourth, and tomorrow is... Are you ready? Say hit it, Brian. <laughs> You know, and Brian has never taken a lesson. That was ad lib. That was pretty good. I mean, really, really good. Anyway, it's the Kentucky Derby. And we will be carrying the Kentucky, the Kentucky Derby live starting at, I believe, 5 o'clock. It starts at 5 and goes until 7.30. And even if you don't know anything at all about horse racing, the Kentucky Derby takes sports to where it's more than sports. It's not just a sporting event. It's an event, capital E, a big, big deal. And lots and lots of people are really interested in the Kentucky Derby, not only just down south, but up here, too. It's just a big deal. It's like the, uh, you might call it the Super Bowl of horse racing. The Super Bowl is more than a football game. Even if you don't know anything about football, the Super Bowl is a big deal. People have parties and all this stuff, and they plan for weeks and, you know, and all that. So it's, it's really a big deal. And as I said earlier this week, I was, uh, I was in Northern Virginia. I was living in Northern Virginia for six months in 1973, which, if you recall, is when Secretariat won the Triple Crown, starting with the Kentucky Derby. 
And as I said, it's madness down there. I mean, it is just all over the place. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, no matter what product is being advertised, it all has a tie-in with the Derby. And this was in Northern Virginia, as I said, which is like quite a ways from where the Derby is held. But it's huge down there. It is really big. And uh, people really get into it. And I remember, you know, just I just I just thought of that. Living six months in Northern Virginia, it's pretty hot and humid down there. And that's the only reason I left. It was just way too hot and way too humid. And so this, this was, I moved there in the spring. And even then it was hot and humid. But there, I, was, I thought of this earlier. Uh, the, um, there's something about a Southern accent that gets to you real quick. Now, I am from New York. And I was down there for about maybe two, three weeks. I mean, just two, three weeks. And I was saying stuff like, y'all. I mean, how does that happen? Now, I was doing it with a New York accent. So it came out something like, hey, how you doing, y'all? I mean, it sounded really weird. But you start saying y'all in no time at all. Y'all coming over? I was in Georgia for a year. Yeah. I only picked up one little thing. Okay. Um, Accent-wise. Okay. Which Instead is? Instead of saying county. Okay. I said county. County. It went away quickly once I got back <laughs> up here. Oh, you can't take shots for it. You know, so there you are. It's, uh, yeah, but a southern accent is really catchy. Hey, yeah, how you doing, y'all? Uh, yeah, so the Derby's, <laughs> so the Derby's really, really a big deal. And uh, I did a little reading on it here. Uh, actually, I could tell you everything I know about horse racing in five seconds. And here it goes. You have a couple of horses, and they race, and one wins. And that's it. That's really all I know about horse racing. But it is kind of fun. The Derby is more than just a horse race, as I said. It's an event with a capital E. The Derby, by the way, is, uh, let me see, one and a quarter mile. Or one and a quarter the miles, I guess. So it, how long is one and a quarter miles? Well, you know, let's see a, a reference everybody can relate to. How about the Hornell Track? A Hornell High School? You go around once, it's a quarter of a mile. It's 440 yards. So a mile and a quarter would be one, two, three, four, five, five times around the track. And that's how long a mile and a quarter is. And when you think of what's going on in a horse race, you think you have a little jockey on a great big horse running really fast with a bunch of other horses right there. And it gets pretty dangerous. I mean, if something happens... Somebody's going to get hurt. And think what you will about that. That's what horse racing is. That's the nature of a horse race. I'm, horse races have been going on as long as there have been horses and people. I mean, there have been horse races going on. So that's, that's what that is. And as I said, we will be carrying it Saturday for starting at 5 until 7.30. And after the Derby, we will carry the Preakness, which is the second uh, leg of the Triple Crown. And then after that comes the Belmont. So all three, Derby, Preakness, Belmont, right here on WLEA. Um, and then it was thinking, you know, before the Derby, WLEA also carried the Masters. Now, the Masters golf tournament is like the Kentucky Derby of golf. Now, there are many, many, uh, you cannot find a weekend without a PGA tournament going on. There are tournaments all the time. But the Masters is special. For some reason, the Masters has gotten to be top dog on the golf circuit. Masters is huge, and WLEA carried the Masters. And I remember thinking when Brian told me that we were going to carry the Masters, I said, you know, golf is not really a radio-friendly sport because it's, it's all visual. I mean, golf is all visual. And I thought, how are they going to call a golf game on the radio? So I listened for about 45 minutes to W. That was Westwood One, right, Brian? I hope I am right. Okay, good. It was Westwood One. I should have checked first. Uh, yeah, so I listened for about 45 minutes. And I don't know how those announcers did it, but they actually put the excitement of golf into a radio broadcast. And you think of radio as being, well, it's either baseball. That's good. I made for radio, baseball, football, basketball, but golf? How do you do that? But, but they did it. And I was really super impressed because I have no idea how they did it. I don't know. And then before the Masters, we had uh, the Super Bowl. 
So you have the Super Bowl, and then you have the Masters, and now the Kentucky Derby, and then the rest of the Triple Crown right here on WLEA. I think that is pretty cool. That is really, really pretty cool. Okay, uh, hmm, where were we here? For these things I managed to print out this morning, finally, sort of. I did mention yesterday that Florida lawmakers have approved the bill that would allow teachers to carry firearms. In response, of course, to the uh, shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, and 17 people died in that. And so with proper training and you know, certification and background checks and, you know, uh, all that, they will be allowed to arm themselves. And I thought, boy, isn't that odd? I mean, isn't that really odd, teachers being armed? I mean, I don't have any kids in school. Now, my granddaughter's a senior in high school, but let's say that you have, like, you know, a kindergartner or a second grader in school, and you know that the teachers can be armed. I mean, is that good or bad? I don't know. But teachers, at least in Florida, can be armed. And I think that's a really, really sad comment. You know, years ago, this is like many, many thousand years ago, uh, if you were a kiss-up, okay, you bring the teacher an apple, I'm going to bring the teacher an apple and maybe score a couple of points. Now, you bring the teacher a bulletproof vest. So things have moved on a little bit from there. But anyway, I did mention there's a possibility. Let's say that something happens with that gun, and somebody gets a hold of it who isn't supposed to. Or let's say that you, you, you're talking about firearms in schools here. And <laughs> just, uh, let me see, was it yesterday? Yeah, it was in yesterday's, let me see, Newsweek. This is on the Newsweek website. A Florida officer's gun discharges in school as students line up for lunch. Okay, here's what happened there. An investigation has been launched after the weapon carried by a Florida officer discharged yesterday in a school cafeteria while students lined up for food. The incident occurred in the Thomas E. Whiteman Middle School in Wesley Chapel at around 12.40 p.m., according to a spokesman for the county sheriff's office. Uh, there were no injuries to any students, staff members, or the school resource officer, the SRO. And apparently a spokesman for the sheriff's office said uh, the uh, officer has not been named, and he had been assisting with lunch duty when his, quote, whole holstered weapon unintentionally discharged, the bullet fired behind him, striking a tile floor and brick wall. Luckily, there was no one behind him, Right. And the spokesman confirmed that an investigation has been launched to determine exactly what had happened. He noted that the SRO has been temporarily reassigned per protocol. It is believed the officer was leaning against the wall at the time. Okay, so maybe there couldn't have been a student behind him. But still, anyway, it was a 9 millimeter, uh, And it was clear from the uh, spokesman's comments that a probe remains in a preliminary, uh, preliminary stage. He said deputies will review uh, uh, camera footage and uh, the SRO's body cam was not recording at the time. And he said also, there are a number of safety features on the threat level three holsters that we carry with our firearms. So there are a number of dynamic factors that are involved with fine motor skilled functions that would cause that to happen. So we have to really kind of really dissect that, he said. Okay, now the reaction of the students. Now these are kids, uh, I guess, uh, let me see, a uh, sixth grade, so what's that, in elementary school, I guess? Some of the students of the school feared the worst. As the single shot rang out, it scared me so bad I dropped my tray, said an 8th grader named Madison. Another student, a 6th grader named Chanel, told a Florida news station, when I first heard the shot, I was like, what if there's a school shooting and this is where I die? Now that's not really a way, <laughs> that's not really a way to go to school. That's not the way things should work, but apparently that's where we've come. And I think just a very, very sad thing. So they're going to investigate what happened, and they're going to try to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And we will be back after a word from our sponsors. New to golf or seasoned veteran? You'll enjoy the casual, relaxed atmosphere of Vanderview Golf Course. Two miles from downtown Alfred on Waterwells Road, Vanderview is a nine-hole, executive-length golf course with a driving range on one side of the road and the course on the other. Family-friendly and fun recreation for everyone. Greens fees are one price for unlimited play, $9.50. High school students, only $5. Children 12 and under, 
with an adult, no charge. You can play up to 18 holes or 9 holes with a cart and get the second 9 holes at no additional charge. Ladies and senior golfers who don't hit the long ball, Vanderview's got the executive length that's just right for your game. And new this year, a season pass for only $100. That's a lot of golfing fun for a very little bit of money. Vanderview Golf Course, two miles from downtown Alfred on Waterwells Road. Vanderview Golf Course. And we have Rob Carolyn, I believe, on the line here. You would be correct, Jonathan. How are you this morning, sir? Very good, very good. Having some computer problems, but every, other than that, everything is just fine. So, well, you know, sounds I was t- like a Monday morning. <laughs> you know, I was telling our listeners, it kind of finally sounds or feels like spring. Spring peepers are out, hummingbirds, all that, very nice. Yeah, now if we could just get a couple of sunny days in a row, everything would be perfect. Uh, that's been the only missing ingredient. Uh, anytime we get any sunshine, sunshine here, Jonathan, it seems to go away after a day or two. Uh, we continue with a very active pattern from Texas into the Midwest and across the northeastern part of the country. Uh, we've got still very cold air up in central Canada, warm summer-like air down in the southeast, and we're stuck in the uh, areas in between. So uh, this frontal boundary just off to our north will continue to remain active right through the weekend. Weather-wise today, uh, the issue will be wide. Widely scattered showers at times, particularly this morning. Uh, We do stay mild, 65 to 70. Sunrise this morning was at 602. Sun will set tonight at uh, 812. Tonight it looks like we'll have clouds and a couple of showers. Nighttime lows anywhere from 45 to 50. Tomorrow, if you're looking to get some stuff done outside, I think you'll be okay. Clouds, maybe an isolated shower, 60 to 65. Another wave of low pressure passes south of the region Saturday night. Scattered showers, 45 to 50. We'll break into a little bit of sunshine Sunday. May see a stray shower, 60 to 65. And looks like it's partly sunny into Monday of next week. Wow. Okay, that's not looking bad at all. No, it's not terrible. It could be a whole lot better, but uh, certainly better than some of the uh, areas off to our east. Uh, the weather to our east from uh, Albany to New England has been pretty bad the last uh, couple of weeks, and it doesn't look like it's getting any better. Wow. Now, I know this isn't exactly your purview here, but have you read anything anywhere about, uh, let's say, the next like month or two? Is it going to be hotter than usual, colder, or what? No, it looks like it's probably going to stay uh, unsettled, uh, Jonathan. We've got this uh, battleground that uh, shows no signs of breaking up because of the cold air up in Canada and the warmth in the southeastern United States. So I think we're probably going to see temperatures near normal and uh, probably see above normal precipitation through the month of May. Hmm. All right. Well, that's not bad. Okay, Rob, thanks. See you next Friday. You got it. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye. From the Fox Business Network, today we'll get a better idea of how the job market was in April. The Labor Department releases the monthly employment report today. Economists surveyed by the Wall Street Journal believe 190,000 new jobs were created and the unemployment rate held at 3.8 percent. Verizon wants to sell the blogging website Tumblr. The Wall Street Journal says the process is still underway and might not result in a sale. Tumblr is a free service with more than 400 million blogs. Veggie burger company Beyond Meat raised more than $240 million in its stock debut yesterday. It was priced at $25 and rose as high as $73 before closing at $65.75. The Dow dropped 122 yesterday. The Nasdaq was down 12. S&P lost 6. With the Fox Business Report, I'm Jenny Cosola. Mother's Day is next Sunday, and Pro Flowers is offering an amazing special. One dozen assorted roses for $19.99. Plus, get double the roses with a premium vase for just $9.99 more. Pick your delivery date and send mom a dozen assorted roses for just $19.99. Or double the roses and get a premium glass vase for $9.99 more. To get this amazing deal, hurry to proflowers.com. Click on the microphone in the upper right corner and enter the secret code 5757. Proflowers.com, code 5757. Okay, and back we are. You know, I found this on a website called Campus Reform, and this is, you would expect this, somewhere at some uh, university in California, at Berkeley, let's say, (laughs) or somewhere in the Bay Area, but no, this is right here. And the headline of the story is, Founding Fathers Under Attack, Students Demand Thomas Jefferson Statue Removal. And other than that, we have students at Hofstra University. This is not some small school. This is like like a major school. Students at Hofstra Hofstra University are demanding the school remove a Thomas Jefferson statue. 
The group included other demands as well, including, quote, mandated comprehensive cultural competency training. Now, you're not talking, <laughs> you're not talking Jefferson Davis, okay? You're talking Thomas Jefferson. Students at Hofstra University protested a statue of Thomas Jefferson at the second annual event titled Jefferson Has Gotta Go. If you recall, I believe Thomas Jefferson was the one who wrote the Declaration of Independence. I think I have that straight. Anyway, the, stu the uh, statue has been the center of controversy, and what is not, the center of controversy on the campus and has been defaced with, quote, decolonize and Black Lives Matter signs and stickers. According to a media advisor sent by the Jefferson Has Got a Go campaign, JGG campaign, the protest was held at Hofstra Hall. Organizers included students of Hofstra University, staff from Planned Parenthood, Nassau County, and supporters of Hempstead Community. The group gathered on campus to, ex to quote, expose the culture of bias and discrimination as stated in the media advisory and to demand, quote, the statue of Thomas Jefferson is removed. Hofstra College Democrats want the statue to be removed and stand with the Jefferson Has Got to Go campaign, the group's president told Cam Campus Reform. Former College Democrats executive board member Miranda Pino also professed her support. JGG isn't just about a statue, she told Campus Reform. Yes, the removal of the statue is important, but it is about what the state the statue represents, a legacy of racism and bigotry on college campuses. Now, how they get that legacy of racism and bigotry on college campuses from a st statue of Jefferson of, uh, of Thomas Jefferson, I mean, you kind of wonder, how, how do they draw the line between Thomas Jefferson and racism and bigotry? Anyway, further demands from JGG stated in its media advisory include an online bias reporting system, an online complaint receipt program, and mandated comprehensive cultural competency training. Now, I don't know exactly how this is going to go, but I don't think Thomas Jefferson really represents racism and bigotry. As I said, he's the one who wrote the Declaration of Independence. I don't, and the, pro, the, the protest, by the way, this most recent protest came just hours after George Washington University students voted to ditch the school's mascot, George the Colonial, named after another founding father, which would be, let me see, George Washington. Anyway, you know, it started, what was it, two years ago, two, three years ago? when they started to tear down statues of Civil War or the Confederate Civil War generals and colonels and all that stuff. And you, you, you might like things the, the way they, or let me put it another way, maybe you don't like the way things were, but however they were, they are part of our history, like it or not. And you start tearing down statues and demanding this and demanding that, and this is racism and this is bigotry and this is whatever, you know, there, there's, there's something wrong. It's our history, as I said, like it or not. And I think it's kind of just, it's just, it's crazy. I mean, it's just crazy. I just don't know. You can't undo something that was done. You cannot undo what was done. And you could take down all the statues you want, but you're not going to change what happened. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be there for all time. I mean, it happened, and there you go. And I still wonder how, how Thomas Jefferson has something to do with racism and bigotry on college campuses. And that's what apparently this group says. That's what the statue represents. So, and this, as I said, this, this, is, this is in Berkeley we're talking about here. Or UCLA. This is Hofstra on Long Island. So, I, I don't know. Anyway, so I, I see here now that the statue has been vandalized. Well, that, what a surprise that is. Um, yeah, so we'll just see how that goes. And I hope, you know, at some point, we got to reach some kind of equilibrium here. You know, we've got to reach an equilibrium. You can't go tearing the stuff down. I don't know. Well, nonetheless, off I go, and I hope I can uh, get my computer going and the printer going.
and to see if the car needs an oil change. Of course it does that. I still have 2,500 miles left. I don't understand that. Anyway, okay, I'll see you Monday. Bye.